When my telephone rang, it jerked me out of one nightmare and right into the middle of another, where a woman with a secret, a worried man, and a shadow out of the past met with fear and fury in the dead of night. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Friend from Detroit. There was a wood nymph dressed in nothing but a veil of dewdrops. She was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another on gossamer wings. And with every turn, she smiled. And came closer. But just as I reached out for a hand, something happened. The bluebells changed into old tomato cans and started to ring. A bandy-legged little man with a jackhammer went to work on my head. I fell over a cliff, and just before I landed on a red-hot pile of broken scotch bottles... Oh, I woke up. <sighs> but the jackhammer didn't stop. I switched on the light and looked at my watch... It was one in the a.m., and the phone on my bed table was screaming for an answer. Hello? Marlo, this is Dave. Betty's gone. She's in trouble. You gotta help me, Marlo. You gotta come over to my apartment yeah, right away. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is this? Dave, Dave Pryor. I run the coffee joint in the corner. You know oh, me. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Dave. I remember. What's the matter? My wife, Betty, she's gone. You gotta help me. Dave, it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm in bed. Besides, you know I don't monkey with family quarrels. It's not like that. Phil, believe me, I'm scared for her. Phil, please come over to the apartment. 2,000 beats would right away. It's okay, a matter of life. Okay, and... I'll be there in 10 minutes. Marlo, I thought you'd never get here. Look, somebody fired a shot through the door, and when I got back with the aspirin, Betty was gone, All and right, I grabbed it. The... Dave, hold it. I'm not even awake yet. Look, sit down. Take it from the top. Slow. Yeah, okay. Maybe it started this morning at the coffee joint when a fancy guy came in and talked to Betty. She waits on the table. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah, I know. What do you mean, fancy? Well, a slick dress, a cufflink, stick pin, all that. I didn't know him, and Betty tossed him off to me as a masher. Maybe he was, but she seemed upset. Slower, by him. huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, tonight about nine, another guy came in, a chunky bird with a deep voice. Betty had just got back from shopping, and I was in the kitchen. See, when I heard a tray of dishes fall, and Betty came back, white as a sheet. She was scared, Phil, scared, scared. Hey! Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. All right. Phil. Go well, ahead. I looked out, and, and that chunky guy was leaving. Betty insisted he had nothing to do with it, that she was just nervous. Was somebody else in the place at the time? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, some Tribune reporter that comes in every night was up at the counter. He was the only one. And Betty stayed on the job till you closed, huh? Yeah, till midnight. But, Phil, she was in a bad shape. Mm -hmm. After we got home here, she sent me out with some aspirin. I was only out for 15 minutes, Phil. When I came back, she was gone. And look, look, this bullet hole in the glass door to the backyard. Somebody out there shot at her. And maybe hit her All or right, something. All right, Dave, steady. Now take it easy. You and Betty have a gun? No. Why? Well, in the first place, the bullet went out through this glass. It didn't come in. And another thing, Dave, who, who did you call tonight after you phoned me? Why, nobody. Phone directory on the dresser here is open to the bees. Boone to wardrobe. Mean anything to you? No, I didn't even realize it was over there. I looked you up in the classified. Mm-hmm. Okay, come on. Let's take a look in the backyard. Any light out there? Yeah, I rigged one up for the barbecue. Look, Marlo, there must take be it something easy. you... Now, we'll straighten this out. Believe me. Let's see. The line of sight seems to run somewhere between the barbecue and the gate. No footprints, though, maybe. Marlo! Hmm? Marlo, here by the tree, it's a hat. Gray snap brim, initials V... VR on the sweatband. VR? Mean anything to you? Oh, I know. Well, sure! That's Van Remini's hat. He's the newspaper guy I told you about. Tribune reporter that was in your place tonight? Yeah. Why should he be dodging bullets in your backyard? I don't know. Dave, where's Betty from? Detroit. When she came out here, I gave her a job. And then you both fell for each other and got married, huh? Yeah, two years ago next month. And we've been happy, Phil. We've been... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, look, Dave, why did you call me instead of the cops? I, well, I guess I'm afraid she's mixed up in, well, in something bad. You know, if it turns out that way, I'll have to call him myself. Okay, Phil, but you're on my side until you know for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, now you stay here, close to your phone. Okay. I'll check with you. Right now, i got to get a line on a bareheaded reporter. He can get us started if he hasn't lost anything more than his hat when I find him. So long, Dave. <laughs> The 
reporter's hat, two strangers, and a bullet hole somehow added up to the fast fade of a hard-working kid named Betty, whose husband's only claim to fame was selling the best cup of coffee in town. It made no sense, but as I walked up the street toward my car, I figured that through Van Remini, I could get to the first answer. I was wrong. The first answer got to me. A thick hedge suddenly sprouted arms. One jerked me around while the other held the cold throat of a forty-five against my throat. Your car registration tag says your name is Philip Marlowe. No kidding. How do you suppose that happened? But it doesn't mention your racket. Shamus, maybe? Could be. And you? I'm a tourist. Oh, sure, sure. Just out to see the sights. That's huh? it. One in particular. $25,000 that belongs to me. I don't want any interference from you or that square inside there. You mean Dave Pryor? I mean Dave Pryor. I'll go back in there and tell him to cool off. A little woman is all right. She's just helping an old friend, you might say. Might I say you're the friend? Never mind. Unless Mr. Jitters in there kicks up a fuss, everything will be fine. Betty knows what she's doing. She's got a lot of talent for it. Too much to waste slinging hash. And remember what I said, Marlo. Lay off. I'll remember more than that about you, Foghorn. Just remember to count ten before you move, boy. Well, there's no point in trying to outsmart a forty-five. And with three steps, Foghorn vanished in the night. Also gone was a big chunk of my respect for a doll named Betty Pryor and her taste in old friends. Just so I wasn't jumping to conclusions, I went to my car and drove down to Hollywood Boulevard. At the first all-night gas station, I stopped and put in a call to the Tribune. Where a guy on the desk told me, through a mouthful of mangled cigar, that unless Remini was at Bungalow 24, Beverly Crest Hotel, covering the murder of an ex-Detroit hood, he was fired. Then he hung up. But the one word, Detroit, made the call a jackpot. So I headed for the hotel on the double. It was pink and Spanish and squatted in a grove of well-behaved palm trees at the edge of a domesticated jungle, which gave the illusion of privacy to a string of bungalows that weren't. But number 24 had all the privacy of a glass-faced cutaway beehive when I pulled up in the middle of two squad cars and an ambulance and went inside. Sprawled on the floor in front of a desk was a very well-dressed Exhibit A. Complete with cufflinks and stick pin and presiding as usual was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra, who didn't see me until I walked up beside him. What are you doing here, Marlowe? I can smell blood clear across town. What's the story, Ibarra? The name is Speck Willard, a gambler from Detroit. Retired out here to California a few years back to play horses and women. He was shot to death at about 8 o'clock tonight by a person or a persons unknown. Another gang jam? No, I don't think so. It looks more like armed robbery that got out of hand. How so? We found a currency wrapper from a local bank that read $25,000 in an open drawer in the bedroom. And one of the bellhops saw a woman, unidentified so far, run out of here about the time the coroner says that Willard was shot. A woman? Yeah. That fits because he was known to be quite a nightclubber and general playboy. You wouldn't happen to know something about this woman, would you, Marlowe? Me? Certainly not. <laughs> no, I'm after a man. A live one, I hope. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Marlowe, take this nickel. Hmm? In case you should just happen to hear something, I want you to spend that on a phone call to the police department. <laughs> now, who is it you're looking for? A Tribune reporter named Van Remini, you know him? Unfortunately, that's him over there, the sticky-fingered one by the window, swiping that book of matches just now, the one without a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Thanks, Lieutenant, I'll see you. Hey, uh, Remini, can I talk to you a minute? Yeah, sure, what's on your mind? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Well, don't apologize. What's up, Marlowe? No girl named Betty Pryor. Pryor? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah. She and her husband run a one-arm joint on Franklin, don't they? That's right, Remini. I understand Betty got into a little trouble tonight. Heard about it? Nope. Wouldn't worry, though. Trouble's not new to Betty. Yeah, that's one popular school of thought. Incidentally, you seem to be going a long ways out of your way on this run-of-the-mill murder story, Remini. You're taking a long way around to the point, pal. Get with it. I'm in a hurry. Okay, pal. But keep it under your hat. Won't you? The gray one, I mean. Oh, so that's how Yeah, it that's is. the way it is, yeah. Now, do you mind telling me what you saw in Pryor's backyard tonight? You name it. Shall I play dumb or lie? Suit yourself. See, my press card's just as good as your license, sweetheart. It gets me in, gets me out again. In my dodge, that's called reporting. Remini, I'll squeeze the truth out of you eventually. I'm sorry, I can't wait. I've got a deadline. Anything else? Yeah, one thing, a match. Yeah, sure, Marlowe, any time. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Remini. Yeah? Don't hang on too long, huh? Blabla sends your pinkies. The reporter blew out the match and looked at me steadily for a moment. 
and his lips shaped a word I ignored. Then he walked away. I had seen enough of the book of matches he'd stolen to know it was in the Starkist room, a glossy, glass roof, dine, dance, and drink emporium near Arthur Murray's studio on Wiltshire Boulevard. So I made like I was in for the night and watched Remini leave. All the way to his car, he kept looking back over his shoulder as if he expected to be followed. I waited till he was out of sight, and then I headed for Wiltshire in the Starkist room. But when I got there, it was closed. Remini's car wasn't in the neighborhood, and the only thing that kept the trip from being a total loss was... A spotlighted picture. Ten feet square of a sultry, svelte chanteuse labeled Carla Borden. Whose come on in smile and almost costume was a cinch to increase the accident rate of the block by 20%. But then I took another look at her name and got back to business. It started with a B, as in phone book, opened to Boone and Bordeaux. <laughs> Found a directory, got it open to Boone and Bordeaux, and halfway down the page was Borden, Carla, 2840 North Lucerne. It took ten minutes to get there and two more to find out that she had an apartment, number 17, at the end of the first floor hall. The door was open and I started for it, but ducked back close to the elevator when a woman came out and ran down the corridor toward me. It was Betty Pryor. Hold it, Betty! Whoa! What? Mr. Marlowe, what, what are you... Never mind the stall, Betty. I've been in a long time. Why, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, look, about. you left a pretty worried guy at home. Dave... Send you after me. That's right. Why oh, can't you fools leave me alone? Why does he have to be so stupid? Hey, you've got a few ideas mixed up, kid. Oh, sure, I'm wrong. I'm the one who's all mixed up. <laughs> Let go of Not me. Not until you... I've got a couple of things straight. Now, what happened? Did life in a hamburger stand get a little stale? Yes, you two-bit snoop. Okay. Dave thinks you're in trouble, I think you're in trouble, and I think somebody waved a few bills at you and you lost your grip. Why? And you're, you're in crummy. so deep now you can't get out, and it's no more than you deserve. Now, come no, on. You... We're going right back down the hall to call his apartment. We're going to have a little chat, just the three of us. No, no I won't let... Come on! Take your hands off, Marlowe. Stand still. Well, like two chums, the Foghorn and its forty-five caliber equalizer. Easy does it. You were lucky the first time. Well, Betty, did you get it? No, something went wrong. Something terrible Shut went... up. Marlowe isn't deep. We'll talk after he's out of the way. All right, you. Get in that elevator, chum. And we'll wait right here to see you leave. Get on, on here. That forty-five makes you awful brave, chum. <laughs> This way, we don't offend the lady by being uncouth. You get a chance to go up in the world. Just put your finger on a button. Now, wait a Come minute. Come on. All right. Now, all you have to do is push. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first... The most famous neighbors in radio, the Ronald Coleman's, will pay Jack Benny a visit again tomorrow as CBS's great Sunday night gets underway with another star-studded group of famous entertainers. Amos and Andy, Lum and Abner, Eve Arden as the gay schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. These are only four more of the ten great entertainments which will come your way tomorrow night. Go visiting with the Coleman's on all of these same stations on the Jack Benny Show. And hear the rest of CBS's great Sunday Night 10 as they come one by one over most of these stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Friend from Detroit. My cage on cables with 10 exasperating seconds getting to the next floor. And I was another ten getting free of it, back down the stairs and out into the dark street where the red splash of a taillight disappeared around a corner. And that was all that was left of Foghorn and company. So I turned back toward Carla Borden's room. And when I stepped across the threshold, I found that with the exception of a single bureau that was still intact, apartment number 17 looked like it had just played host to the vortex of a cyclone. The bed, a chest of drawers, another bureau, a desk, everything was inside out. And in the middle of all that was the body of Carla Borden. Blood from a deep, ugly cut on her head, staining the snow-white front of her Angora sweater. And I saw something else, which reminded me that this was not the first corpse of the night. The plush leather frame was shaped like an oversized lifesaver, and in it was the picture of a handsome man, all smiles, inscribed, with love to my very best girl, Speck Willett. <laughs> 
was ten minutes before I got Tennessee Barrow, who was still up at the Beverly Crest Hotel. And after I told him about Collar and her connection with the late Mr. Willard and Betty Pryor and my connection with Dave, I stopped talking and listened. Marla, we just learned that Willard had some kind of a $25,000 caper going with one of his old mobster friends from Detroit, named Joe Lazar. Who maybe is something with a voice and active below bottom? The same, Phil. Anyhow, it looks like they worked out a gambling deal for old time's sake. At the last minute, Willard tried to welch on Lazar and got killed for his trouble. Then Lazar searched the place until he found the 25000 No, no, no. That part doesn't fit, Ibarra. How so? Well, I've run into Lazar twice tonight. I know he and the money are still strangers. Oh? After what happened here with the team of Betty and Lazar getting to the singer Carla, I figure they're still looking for it. Also, I figure Carla was somewhere near when Lazar killed Speck Willard and that she took the money and... I'll call you later, Ibarra. We got clumsy company in the hall outside. All right, ballerina, get your foot out of that bucket and come on in with your hands up. Well, <laughs> the man with a very long nose for news. What brings you around, Remini? For one thing, the fact that you got no corner on brains, Marlowe, and for another, who did that to her? Our mutual friend, Betty Pryor, and her running mate. I believe they were looking for 25,000 bucks. Did she and Joe Lazar get the money, Marlowe? No, they... Hey, Remini, how did you know the man with Betty was named Joe Lazar? Haven't you heard? I'm a good reporter, Marlowe. The mm. kind that keeps eyes and ears open and mouth shut. It isn't until I know the whole story. Which, as far as you're concerned, is precisely what? That I happen to you be... You happen to be? That I happen to be in Dave's restaurant early this evening where I recognize the only other cash customer is Joe Lazar. Oh. An out-of-work mobster from Detroit. He said something to Betty that scared her right out of a tray of dishes, so I figured I'd find out what was going on. I've been in on the show ever since. Yeah. Including a corny blackout up at 2000 Beachwood Drive where you lost your hat running away from a bullet. That's right. Uh-huh. And just so you don't toss and turn when you get around to going to bed tonight, I'll fill in the rest. I followed Betty and Dave from the restaurant to their apartment. I watched her get rid of Dave, and then when I saw Lazar come in, I moved up close to the window. And stayed there. Until Lazar spotted you and threw a bullet your way? You're very clever. Yes, I am, man. But before that happened, I heard him tell Betty that Speck Willard had talked about a girl singer at the Starkiss room named uh, Carla Borden. And that since he didn't know Carla on sight, she could have been a lady he'd seen running out of Speck's apartment with a 25 gram. Oh. Now that phone book of Dave's open to the bees ties in. I'm so glad. Now, Marlowe, lest we digress too far, how come this one bureau here hasn't been turned upside down along with everything else? I don't know. Any more than I know why you're holding back so much from the law. Well, maybe it's because I don't like cops, Marlowe. Oh, black ones. Or maybe it's because I'm in the same kind of racket as you. Chin way out and a lot of fast talk, just so papers can know what's going on an hour ahead of the rest of the world. Well, there's no 25000 in here. I got a blow. Before Ibarra shows? Before Ibarra shows. He always arrives with an entourage, Marlowe, one that includes other news mm. hounds. So it's me for a fast cab in downtown and my paper with a story. Go on, fellow. See you around. Hey, wait a minute, Remini. Yeah? I'll give you a lift. I'm going that way myself. Okay. I got a story, too. A lousy story. I've got to tell a nice guy named Dave. Come on. All the time we drove, Remini half-faced me and smoked one cigarette after another while he rattled on about Joe Lazar. The great story he had and a lot of other things I didn't hear because I was busy trying to find the right words with which to tell Dave Pryor that his wife was no good. So when we were about halfway to Beachwood Drive and Remini, who was pushing close to his deadline, decided to get out and phone his story in from a drugstore, I was glad. So long, Marlowe. A second after that, I knew I was kidding myself. Because even with just silence for company, I was still no place with the right words. (laughs) Ten minutes later, when I stood in front of Dave on the steps to his house and stammered out the facts just as I had run across them, I forgot about words. Right or wrong. But thought instead about my client, a badly hurt guy. But one who would never say die. Marlo, I can't believe all this. I won't. Tell me, where's Betty now? I don't know, Dave. Now look, maybe we ought to head for police headquarters because sooner or later we're each going to have a story to tell Lieutenant Ibarra. Come on, my car's over here. Okay, Phil. I guess that's the only thing to do, all right? Yeah, I guess so. Here. Here. Better have a cigarette, Davy. Oh, thanks. Kid, we'll try to make this as painless as we... As we what, Marlowe? What is it? Hmm? 
Well, what are you staring at? Front seat. But I don't see anything, Phil. What is it? What shut are you up, staring Dave. Shut up. Give me a minute, will you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come on, Dave. Pile in. But why, Marla? Where are we going? Doc, it's room to play a long shot. Slapped my foot down hard on the accelerator and kept it that way right through a string of I didn't care what color traffic lights until five minutes later when we screeched to a stop away from the side entrance to the Starkist room. I left Dave in the front seat, piled out fast, and ran a dozen yards to an abrupt halt. At the sight of something that turned the long shot I was playing into a into an odds-on favorite. It was the stage entrance door open a couple of inches, and in front of that, and unconscious on the hard sidewalk where it had fallen was a clad in blue form of a private patrolman, his pistol holster conspicuously empty. <laughs> Inside, I slowly picked my way along an L-shaped corridor until I saw a shaft of bright yellow from a flashlight. It was moving away from a door marked Carla Borden. It brought me up short and flat against the wall. But then as the man on the other end of the beam of light moved away from me, I... I got a very steady grip on the thirty-eight in my pocket and started after him. A minute later, he entered the main room of the club and it was there as he started across the glass ceiling dance floor... But I recognized the very self-confident gait of a very self-confident guy. And that made the next move mine. Bar's closed, what? Remini, and don't move, Buster. I'll blow your head off. Ah, looks like you're making news this time, good reporter. Or isn't that package in your hand the 25 grand you just found in Carla Borden's dressing room, huh? The same Carla Borden you murdered not an hour ago in an apartment on Lucerne, where you first thought the money was... Where Betty Pryor surprised you before you could finish searching. Where you later returned in the role of an all-American newsboy so you could get to that last bureau. All right, all right. I've heard enough, Marlowe. But I'm not going to stick around for more details. You make a break and I'll shoot Remini. Try it, Eagle. Stop, Remini. Stop! Uh, Marlowe. Nice shooting, Marlowe. But don't turn around because where I'm standing, it's dark. And where you're standing, it's light. Now throw your gun away, fella. Come on, toss it! That's better. All right, Betty. Get over to that dead newspaper guy and get the money. All and we'll right. take care of the private detective here. What do you mean, take care, Joe? I, I can't go along with murder. Speck Willard's death didn't seem to bother you any. Shut up, Marlowe. Speck Willard. Joe, you... Joe, you killed... Yes, I killed Speck, that... Well, sure. Eight o'clock tonight. And I had to stay undercover, but still get my hands on the money. So, I came to you for help. But I didn't tell you about the killing, because I didn't think you'd play ball if you knew about it. Now, all that's history now, and I'll still go to your dear husband, Dave, and talk lots about the kind of cheap kid you used to be in Detroit if you don't get moving. Now, what do you say, Betty? I say no, Joe. I also say I made a mistake in the first place letting you use me to run your filthy errands just so the guy I love wouldn't have to know about the kind of people I once ran around with before I had any brains. All right. That's the dumb way you want it. That's the dumb way it'll be. Taking care of two years is much harder than taking care of one. What about three, Lazar? Dave! Dave, stay back! No, Marlo, no. I've stayed back too long already. I've stayed back while Betty has been risking her life to protect what we've got. If you take another step, I'll shoot, kid. I'm warning you for the last time. Stay back! No, Lazar, I won't! <laughs> you no. thinking scum, Lazar? No. Oh, Dave, you're hit. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'll be all right. I'll be all right now, Betty. Dr. Reese, Dr. Reese, please report to surgery. Well, Mrs. Pryor, Dr. Reese, Harlow, the please doctor says that Dave's going to surgery. be fine in a couple of days. Yeah. Caught one on the shoulder, the other on the hip. He certainly had courage, didn't he? Yeah, and you did all right, too, Betty. Mixing in this whole mess just to keep the home fires burning. Oh, uh, Tell me, whatever Dr. made you Reese, think that a guy like Dave Reese wouldn't understand that you'd turned over a new leaf? Well, I... Dr. Reese wanted in I surgery. don't know, Phil. I guess I wasn't very smart. No, you weren't, Mrs. Pryor, but you're lucky because Marlowe here was. And that brings me around to a loose end, Phil. How did you know that Remini was your man? No, that. Because of something I saw in the upholstery of the front seat of my car, Ibarra. Tufts of snow-white angora, which was the kind of sweater that Carla Borden had on when she was murdered after they struggled. And since you didn't touch the body yourself, they couldn't have come from your suit. No. And Remini was the only other one who had been in my car. So I figured that the Angora fuzz had gone from Carla's sweater to Remini's suit to my upholstery. 
All of which means that Remini must have been in Carla's room before I got there as well as after. See? And then once I thought back about his getting out of my car to phone his story in, I... Well, I realized that when I dropped him near a drugstore, he had also been near the star kissed room. Yes. That's exactly where he'd headed. Mm-hmm. You see, Phil, Joe and I followed both of you from Carla Borden's place because... Well, after Joe put you in that elevator and we ran, Joe said we had to return and wait for Remini, who was sure to come back and finish his search. And the whole business, because Lazar, after he had murdered Speck Willard, was afraid to publicly go after Carla Borden and the money he felt was his. Yes. And he knew about me and Dave because Speck Willard accidentally dropped into our place this morning. Uh, correction, for... baby. What? Yesterday morning. Oh. It's now 9 a.m. Oh. <clears throat> and a good time to call quits, huh? <laughs> good night, kids. By the time I got back to my apartment on Franklin, it was half past ten in the too bright morning. I was sporting sandpaper eyelids and a knot in the small of my back that felt like a wet dish rag. Oh, but once I had all the shades down and was undressed and in bed, I forgot about that. And I thought instead of the wood nymph dressed in nothing, hmm, with a veil of dewdrops. But then suddenly I stopped. The telephone. I got out of bed. I picked it up with both hands, opened the dresser drawer, and jammed it deep under all the socks I owned. And then I got back to bed. And the wood nymph, in her veil of dewdrops, she was she was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another. Oh my. Uh, on gossamer wing. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Betty Pryor, Peter Leeds as Dave Pryor, Harry Bartell as Van Remini, and Ed Begley as Joe Lazar. Lieutenant Detective Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard (laughs) O'Ron. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets with danger waiting at every intersection until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted and death brought an end to the game. Coleman's visiting Jack Benny, plus Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. Yes, that earlier announcement about CBS programs tomorrow night sounded great, didn't it? Except you Philip Marlowe fans may have been wondering, isn't there a mystery show among that great Sunday night 10 on CBS? Of course there is. One of the great detectives in the mystery world, Dashiell Hammett's one and only Sam Spade. Sam will be here, hard-hitting, fast-moving as always, tomorrow night on most of the same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of the same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.